the threefold social organism. And before I forget, uh, can I just draw your attention to the board here where I've just written, if you find this talk interesting, you can follow up further ideas, particularly in these um, three books. <clears throat> the first one is called uh, Functional Threefoldness in the Human Organism and Human Society by Johannes Roman. And he's really building on the um, uh, initiatives given by Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian spiritual scientist and philosopher, uh, in around about 1919, at the end of the First World War, and then translated in English as Towards Social Renewal. Sometimes you can find this book in with other titles, but this is one of the latest, the latest ones, Towards Social Renewal. So this is, some, you could say, the, uh, the basic presentation, the original presentation of these ideas. Um, and then this is also a very I think, interesting one, and uh, very contemporary in a sense, directly for us. You notice the subtitle is Crisis and Opportunity for the West, and that's certainly where we are now. Crisis in the West. Uh, ideas for a new Europe. Um, so I've written those down there, so if you want to make a note of them later, please do. But perhaps I'll, I'll start by just referring to something in this, because in 1919, um, a group of English people went to Switzerland, where Udo Steiner was then based, in the winter of 1919-1920. Uh, and uh, Steiner sort of, uh, he really sort of gave it to these English people in a way, things which were rather difficult for them to hear, perhaps, because he spoke to them about imperialism. And um, I'm going to start talking about this now, to give a little, a little bit of historical background. And then I'm going to come to where we are now, and then come to threefolding as a solution to the problems that we have now. So when, what he did in speaking uh, about imperialism to these English people, because after all, the war just ended, and the British Empire had expanded to its greatest ever historical uh, expansion uh, limit by taking on the German colonies as well. Um, and he spoke to them about the evolution of imperialism. He spoke to them how the concept of empire had changed through the centuries in three broad phases. The first was what you call the imperialism of the priests. So if you go back to the times of ancient Egypt, for example, there you find that society is completely dominated by the priesthood. The pharaoh was a god king on earth. One could also think of the Chinese emperor, the emperor of Japan. So your rule, the society, the empire, is ruled by a divine being and is regarded as such. And the ministers are the priesthood. There is no independent or separate political realm, such as we understand it today. There is no independent um, autonomous business or economic realm. Everything is informed by the spiritual realm, the priesthood. And that goes on through evolution until around about the 8th century. Gradually, we start to see the development in Greece and then Rome um, of a new form of social organization, a new kind of empire, if you will, emerging, which we could call the rule of the politicians or the, the kings, the aristocrats, the military class. And connected with them, the merchants and traders not industrialists, not manufacturers yet, that will come later, but merchants and traders, the importance of them starts to come out. But above all here, it's the, it's the political class, the political rulers, who began to begin to emancipate themselves from the control of the priesthood, the spiritual realm. Yeah? And that goes through the Greek and Roman times until we come right up until the medieval period, for example, in Europe, where you have these conflicts between, on the continent, the emperors and the popes. Or you could say, uh, in, in, uh, in England at that time, you had Henry VIII and his struggle with the pope, and so on. Um, so, by the 14th, 15th century, you have now two forces. You have the older empire of the priesthood, spiritual control, and you have the newer, control of the, the politicians, the political groups, the political class, if you will, the aristocracy, the kings. 
So two, two forces there. And then from the 15th century, gradually, as I said, beginning with merchants and traders, and then Italy, 14th century, the bankers start to emerge. The economic realm begins to emerge in, for example, let's just limit it to European culture at the moment, but I could also talk about Japan from this perspective, because I, I was in Japan a long time, and I know quite a bit about Japanese history. And you can see parallel developments there. But in Europe at this time, we see how from then, the economic uh, rulership, if you will, or direction, begins to emerge and begins to seek its own autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the political groups. Now that is a process which is not yet complete. So the, we can say that the economic realm has not yet developed to the point in our Western capitalist society where it is standing fully on its own feet vis-a-vis -vis the state, the government. We're still struggling with that. So this phase, this final phase, the third phase, is not yet completed. But it's, it's in train. So we can see over a long period of time, there's been this growth, beginning with the spiritual realm, and then the political realm, and then now the, and now the economic realm. So this is why Stein was saying to not only these English people, but basically at that time anybody who, who, who attended these lectures on uh, social matters that this question of threefolding, which I'll elaborate in a moment, that threefolding is not something which is just dreamed up by some intellectual or professor or even Steiner himself. It's actually something which has been evolving over a long time in the history of the West, reaching right back to Egypt. Yeah? The spiritual realm, the political realm, and the economic realm as three different aspects of society each one of which strives to become independent of the others. And there are periods of struggle, and that's difficult. And then eventually it happens. And so now we take it for granted that the state should not be controlled by the church. Or do we? <laughs> and we I'm aware, I mean, I don't hear. So that is still, to a certain extent, a question, you see? It's still a question. But, for example, in England and in other countries, that is, it's, it's like a, an issue which has sort of been resolved. In America, of course, you had a very strong separation of those three, those three, state and church. Um, but the question of to what degree these three elements, the cultural, spiritual realm, the priesthood, the educationalists, the uh, scientists, the artists, people who work with their minds, their brains, their imagination, the political realm, meaning the, um, the lawyers, politicians, the judge, well not the judge, it's slightly different, I'll come to that later, but particularly the politicians and the lawyers, um, and the economic realm. Uh, the businessmen, the manufacturers, the workers, producers, distributors, consumers. These are all to be independent of each other. And this is a key thought in the uh, the, the whole development of threefold, which a really important thing, particularly for those of you who are new to, to this, is to understand that many of our current problems today result from the confusion of these realms. So politicians telling teachers how to teach, bureaucrats in, infringing on the freedom of teachers to teach in their own classes. How can our children be free if the teachers are not free? Who knows about teaching best? Politicians? Obviously not. Bureaucrats? Obviously not. Yeah? So, and yet, since the 19th century, in many countries, it became the norm for the state to tightly control education. For the purposes of the state, and not for the purposes of the children. The real purposes of the children. So, now we have a situation where, um, more or less, depending on the country, we have the um, insistence, either from the teachers or from those who support them, that people involved in education should be left alone by the state to do the job that they should do. Uh, recently, I was very happy to see a, a new development in England just before I came here, 
where for the first time the Labour Party in England um, declared that they want to get the bureaucrats out of teaching and leave teaching to the teachers. Now you see that was something which, because in England recently we've had the development of so-called free schools and academy schools. Schools which are not restricted or controlled in any way by the state. Except insofar as the state insists on the rights, and this is justified, that the you know the, the conditions, the physical conditions for the children are good. Yeah? And it's not the dirty schools, it's a healthy environment. Well that's fine. That's a question of rights, you see. It's not a question of curriculum. The question is the state has a duty and, a, and, a, and the obligation and the right to insist that all children have the right to clean toilets, have the right to wash basins, have the right to playground area, and so on. That's rights. And that's where the state really belongs, in that rights realm, equal rights for all. But when it comes to what to teach and how to teach, that's not the state's business. So, that the Labour Party should decide and should agree now, we too, like the Conservatives, like the Liberal Democrats, support the idea that um, the state, the bureaucrats, should not be involved in how to teach, telling teachers what to teach, is a real positive step forward. So for the first time, you've got all the political parties saying, well, we're prepared to go along with this. Now, that's an example, you see, of what Stein would say that um, obviously, they're not doing this because they read Rudolf Steiner or anything. But he's saying that this is something which is actually seeking to emerge in the natural course of things in history. That the cultural realm should be free to develop itself by itself. Similarly, um, the question of should the state tell the business sector how to run businesses? Well, we saw what happened with that in the Communist Bloc. Yeah? Politicians and bureaucrats are no better at operating the economy than they are operating the school system. So we realised, and the communists also realised, that this is not going to work. The state could not control and should not control the economy. That should be left to the producers, distributors and consumers, the three sections within the economic realm, to get on with and run by themselves. But then we have a big problem very big problem. And the big problem is this. Why is it, for example, that left-wing people since the late 18th century have, have demanded that the state should involve itself in the economic realm? And the reason for that was that the manufacturers and the industrialists, especially after, after the Industrial Revolution, they were treating their workers in an inhuman way. So I, I come from the place just down the road, about an hour's drive, from where the Industrial Revolution actually began, in Ironbridge, in the English Midlands. Yeah? And, um, and there, in Ironbridge, and other places in England, you would have, for example, children being forced to work from a very young age, either overground, or later throughout places in England where there was coal underground. So children forced to work for up to 10, 12 hours uh, a day. Yeah? Now, what kind of, how did it come about that human beings would be prepared to force children to work underground in such circumstances for profit? Yeah? Clearly, there was some, some loss of humanity that had taken place, right? that any, any adult could force a child to do that. But they did. And we also know, of course, how dependent the economy was on slavery at that time, the African triangular slave trade. So clearly something had, had gone wrong with the moral underpinning of the economy. And because many people with sensitive uh, morals and, and a good ethics, so to speak, yeah, recognize that situation, they said, well, how can we protect the vulnerable and the weak, uh, uh, the workers, the children, from this inhuman economic system? Well, they said, well, if the economic system itself can't do that, then we have to call on the state. We have to call on the law. 
And so left-wingers and socialists began to look to the state to give protection to the working class. And that leads on inexorably through the 19th century to the situation in Russia, where in fact the state then ends up running the economy. Um, so why was it then that in the 18th century, with the Industrial Revolution, the manufacturers were treating their workers in this way? I think there are two, basically two reasons for that. One is that the manufacturers had lost sight as human beings, as Western human beings, of their own spiritual values, of their own culture. That means, basically, they were no longer Christians, if in fact they had ever been Christians. Because those of you who are familiar with the New Testament know, for example, what Jesus said about little children. Yeah? People who mistreat little children would be better off almost as if they'd not been born. These are pretty severe things. Um, so they had lost sight of their Christian values. And that's a long process. That goes back some 1800 years almost, how that happened. You know? But by the, ninth, by the 18th century, the situation in the Western world had come to the point where, once again, everything starts, you see, with the spiritual realm, with the cultural realm, with the theological realm. Because beginning with Luther, who says, no to the church. I want to find my own way to God. You will not tell me what my way to God is. I insist on my, I stand here and I insist on my way to, to find the divine. You know? The beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So Luther and other Protestants call for freedom, liberty, in the spiritual, cultural realm. Yeah? The problem was that was so strong in Western culture, that impulse, that it then began to filter into the other aspects of society. So from the, from the, physic, from the cultural, spiritual realm, the desire for liberty is then applied into the political realm. Yeah? Political liberty. And we see that going through the 17th century. So for example, in England, the Civil War, King versus Parliament. Yeah? And then we come into the 18th century, and the Industrial Revolution, this idea of liberty is still so powerful, so ongoing, that then the business people and the manufacturers say, liberty in business and economics. And that is where, in a sense, the rot sets in for capitalism. Because they're insisting on fundamentally the wrong principle there. Why? Because when you've got uh, a shoemaker in the Middle Ages, in his shoemaker shop, um, buying his materials, getting his materials together, running his shop, perhaps with one or two apprentices, making the whole product himself, and then selling it. He's doing everything himself. But by the time you get to the 18th century, and the first steam power comes along, the factories come along, then you get the division of labor. Right? So you've got lots of people now are required to make a particular product. And um, this division of labor means that the fundamental principle of the modern economy is actually cooperation. So Japanese companies, for example, compete furiously today against their economic rivals. But inside the company, nobody would question for a minute that everybody is totally cooperative. It's only against the economic rivals that the, there's this ferocious competition. So that means, you see, that at base, the economic fundamental principle today is, in fact, cooperation. You don't cooperate, you don't get to make anything. In the modern economy, not the medieval economy, the, me the modern economy, which is based on collective, cooperative work. Now, that was completely lost sight of because of this powerful urge to liberty. Yeah? You remember the motto in the 18th century? Liberty, equality, Fraternity, these three abstract terms which emerged at the time of the French Revolution. Well, the last one, fraternity, is really the principle on which the economy should run. I'll say more about that in a minute. But the liberty principle, going right back to the Protestant Reformation, was so powerful, coming from originally the spiritual 
realm. That it was driven down into the political realm and into the economic realm, where it does not belong. Because when you insist on liberty in the economic realm, that means I wish to make X product. And I wish to make this for my profit and the profit of my family. And I will go and get this money from my family or from the bank or from whoever, and then I will build my factory, and then I will employ my workers. And if I don't suddenly need these workers, I shall just sack them. And then if I need to get rid of my waste from my factory in a nearby river, I shall just dump it there, and I should be free to do that. And if anybody objects, I will bribe my local MP to make sure that there are no political problems for me. Everything is based on egocentricity in the, that capitalist realm. So we're still living with that, you see. That today is still, that 18th century concept is still the driving concept of modern capitalism. Now, I'm sure your Prime Minister, Mr. Kenny, and my Prime Minister, Mr. Cameron, are thinking of, um, well, Kenny was recently in, in London uh, in March, on the, third, uh, the 11th of March, he gave a speech at the Mansion House in the City of London, and he said there, um, I want Ireland to be the best small country in the world for business. That was his picture of Ireland in the 21st century. <laughs> best small country in the world for business. That's what he wants for you. Yeah. And Cameron says exactly the same thing. I want England to be the best, because he didn't say small country, and <laughs> empire and all of this, it's still burbling away there, you know, in the English subconscious. But I want England to be the best country in the world for business, he says. Yeah. City of London, Cosmopolitan, all these people come into it, etc. And both Kenny and um, Cameron, and of course Mecco and all the others, what do they do? They point to Asia. They point to Asia and they say, there is the future. There is the future. There's the energy. There's the dynamism. We have to jump onto that, make use of that, profit from that for us. And we all know that all these products, all these electronic things we're using are made by, you know, severely oppressed labour, basically, in that part of the world, which we are indeed profiting from. But the idea that it's the Chinese and the Indians who've got the new dynamic economic ideas, I think is profoundly mistaken. Because what they are doing is basically adopting and applying our ideas of economic selfishness. The same 18th century capitalist principles, they are applying them simply with more oomph, with more energy, because we're a bit tired, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll just speak for Britain. Uh, you know, people said, well, you know, we were the workshop of the world for 200 years or whatever. We're tired of making things. Let somebody else make things. We'd like to be working in the media or, you know, <laughs> pop stars or football stars or something like this. You know. um, so let the Chinese make things if they can make things. That attitude. It's again a selfish attitude, really. Um, my point is that the principle that they're operating on, only with more energy, is the same 18th century concept of liberty in the economic realm. That's what I would like to um, urge you to sort of get hold of that thought, yeah? That liberty in the economic realm is profoundly the wrong principle on which to be running business. And this principle will lead to one crisis after another, Stein was saying, yeah? unless this is realized, unless and until this is realized. And I think we can see that certainly happens in us. We've just gone through this uh, the crisis of 2008, and um, well, now Mr. Kenny is saying, "Ah, oh, we're out of this. We're over the worst here in Ireland." And Cameron is saying exactly the same in Britain. Yeah, we've, we've somehow get about to get through. We're nearly there, but nothing has essentially changed. Bankers. Bankers' bonuses have gone down, 200,000 bankers of people, or people in the banking industry apparently left it in Britain, and you know, all bankers are all thinking Nostra Copa, Nostra Maxima Copa kind of thing. And, um, but nothing has changed in the fundamental way that they approach business, nothing has changed in the way the economic system is operating. Nothing fundamental. It's still based on shareholder value, 
It's still based on the rights of the, the boss to do what he wants with his workers. It's still based on hostile takeovers. Big shark eats small fish. Yeah? It's still based on this essentially egocentric principle. And that's entirely the wrong principle. So, that's a very important aspect. Yeah? Why people turn to the state was because the principle to run the economy was because in the 18th century um, the wrong principle was being applied. And then the other aspect was because people had lost sight of their spiritual values, there was a loss of heart in how to treat other human beings. So those two things together meant that we ended up with the kind of capitalism which we've got. So, another recent development, um, which you, you probably noticed yourself, yeah, was, you remember the, in 2011, the um, Occupy movement we saw in various countries. And one of the main motifs, one of the main calls you heard, from, particularly from young people in the Occupy movement was, get the money out of politics. Remember that? Right? So what's, what are they saying there? They're saying, stop Monsanto and other major corporations from putting pressure on politicians through bribery, through lobby groups, through the use of the law or the abuse of the law. Yeah? Get the money out of politics. So that means separate the, the, the incestuous, confused relationship between economics and politics. Um, that again is an example, I would say, of how almost subconsciously this threefold idea of separating business, politics, and uh, the cultural, social, the cultural, spiritual world, how people are realizing that these have to be separated out. We saw in the, uh, the Olympics last year in, in Britain how these three things were again completely confused. We saw how the Olympics sport, which, is, which belongs in the cultural realm, it's part of human culture, whatever you think of sport, is part of human culture. And we saw how that is obviously deeply bound up with money and business on one hand, and it's also deeply bound up with politics. So since the Olympics, Mr. Cameron has been saying, we are all in a global race. All of us, you, me. Yeah? That's the important thing. We're in a global race. And it is our mission in Britain, for example, and I'm sure Mr. Kenny doesn't say much different. Yeah? It's our mission to fight and compete and win in this global race. Well, is that what life's about? You are an economic athlete or an economic foot soldier engaged in this global race. Is that the meaning of your life? That's how we are encouraged to see Britain and Ireland by our politicians as a competition against other nations. Yeah. Which is bizarre when you think that also they're always talking about globalization at the same time. And they're talking about the global economy and how we depend on the Chinese and so on. But hang on, if we depend on the Chinese, doesn't that mean we're all involved in the global economy? Doesn't that actually mean cooperation? But no, we have to continue this older idea of the nation state controlling the economy to fight against the other nation state economies. So this ancient, this old idea is still carrying on from the 18th century in the 21st century. Now politicians are still carrying on with those same thoughts. Yeah? So this is a, a, another real problem, I think, that our uh, politicians have in separating money, um, culture, and politics. And I'll just stop there for a minute, just to see if there are any little questions at this point, or are you all sort of, are we all following where I am, so to speak, yeah? Yeah. Is it sort of, yeah, so just wonder where the media comes into all this. Right, okay. What do you think? Where does, the, where does the media belong? Yeah? Yeah. What is the media doing? We talk about the media as the opinion formers of society. The media, what do they do? They mediate ideas from certain members, the, the artistic elite, the um, all kinds of elites, yeah. yes, and they mediate that 
to, yes, to the public. So I would say primarily the